Paving the way for more affordable, sustainable homes requires pragmatic policy setting and industry frameworks, not the next big shiny thing, writes Maria Slade in this week's Shoeshine. So Maria, is New Zealand lacking in pragmatic policy setting when it comes to housing? What sparked this was the case of a guy called Murphy O'Neill, who has a venture called Adaptable Structures. And Murphy's a very forthright American who has invested his, all, all his life savings and energy, basically, into developing this prefabricated modular housing system that's based on uh, recycled aluminium framework. So it ticks every kind of sustainability, uh, usability, affordability kind of box. And yet he has... Uh, pretty much failed to get any kind of government agency interested in his venture, and, and he just can't understand it. He It even took him a year to get uh, the R&D tax credit because he had to convince Callaghan Innovation and um, the IRD that what he was doing was, was resor- you know, R&D. And then he tried to apply for a Callaghan grant and was told that they had a different definition of what was R&D and that, it, you know, there was a, a, fu- a fundamentally different way that they applied this kind of grant compared with the tax credit. And, you know, he, he's applied to IMBI, um, Kainga Aura, all sorts of agencies and just nobody seems to, it just doesn't seem to be any way to get any traction for his innovation. And given that, okay, his innovation might not be the right one, but given we have a housing crisis, crisis and you know all government agencies are talking about sustainability and and affordability you'd think they'd be interested but but seemingly not and he was even told i have seen the email chain that government interventions typically are not linked so while Callahan might be doing one specific thing in this specific area, they, they don't have to support innovation generally and they don't have to support innovation in a particular sector, such as construction. So yes, I would say New Zealand does lack a, a pragmatic, um, coordinated approach. And it's not just about the investment, is it? It's, it's more that he needs these big government contracts to be able to build his business. Yeah, well, there's, there's a couple of things in there. One one thing, actually, is um, that we have a very rigid building code that is very designed towards our traditional methods of building in wood. And, uh, you know, just to give you an example there, there is a company called Save Board, which is developing um, wall f- boards like jib alternatives out of recyclable materials. Uh, so very eco-friendly. You know, it's a great venture. He's got plants here and in Australia. But because he doesn't tick a box in the building code, he has to apply to be an alternative product. And that's taken about a year, and he still hasn't got there. And he's also going to apply to be an environmental, to get an environmental product declaration, which is a trans-Tasman standard. But that's going to cost him $100,000. So he says the barriers to innovation are just so high, particularly for small firms like that. Mm. So, so you have that kind of problem, but then there is also this idea of um, off-site manufacturing, which is what Murphy O'Neill is doing with adaptable structures. And that's a manufacturing system, and that's a different idea from construction. And a lot of the housing advocates are saying, well, you know, why have we still got builders putting up open frames on concrete slabs when they're at the mercy of the weather and, you know, they have to get the roof on before they can put the jib on and all this sort of thing? Why isn't much more of this happening off-site? And so many, you know, most industries are all subject to manufacturing disciplines, so why not housing? So is that to do with the inflexible regulation which is stopping this sort of innovation from happening? That is a part of it. And one of the things that has occurred recently, which you know everyone's welcoming as quite a, a big advancement, is we have a thing called Built Ready, which now means that off-site manufacturers uh, who meet certain requirements are able to sign off on their own uh, designs. So rather than having to go to each individual council, and there's about 70-odd of them in this country who will all take slightly different interpretations interpretations of the building code, these guys can come along and go, no, we've got the built ready tick, you have to accept our products. So that has been a big advancement and that has come about uh, through a thing called the Construction Sector Accord, which was set up about five years ago, pre-COVID. Uh, and, um, it, you know, it's it started to sort of gain some traction. But the problem we have now is that has now been a casualty of the coalition agreement and it has been scrapped. So 
you know, where do we go from here? Mm. And so are people um, in the industry, are they hopeful that the new government will help help them uh, in terms of the regulations? Or, you know, they've scrapped this this accord, so what's going on? Yeah, the, the, the scrapping of the construction sector accord has occurred as part of a wider ditching of um, an, an, an industry, industry transformation plan programme the last government had. And the new government does recognise that the work of the accord does need to go on in some way, but they're not prepared to resource it in the same way as the last government was. Um, But yes, there is hope that that work will be picked up. And it is sorely needed because the Commerce Commission, in its report on the building products sector a couple of years ago, it recommended that off-site manufacturing was a really necessary component to try and generate a, you know, competition in the sector and that it really needed an all-of-government approach to you know, get it happening. Because the thing is, of course, it, it's not like a you know, traditional builder who if work slows off, he can just lay off a few staff or whatever. If you're investing in an OSM plant, you, you know, you've got millions of dollars invested in equipment and so forth, you need a pipeline uh, you need to be sure that there is a pipeline of work happening. And that's where things like government procurement decisions can make a difference. Uh, I've heard that in Canada, the government will only hand out contracts if buildings can be completed within a certain time frame. So, you know, this is the sort of thing housing ad- advocates are saying we need to be looking at here. And, yeah, so watch this space with this new government, whether they're going to pick up that work and, and try and generate a, mo- a more coordinated approach to fostering innovation. Thanks, Maria. Thank you. For more content just like this and all the latest business and political news, head over to mbr.co.nz.